you look at your bio. When you left college, mm -hmm. you came back and worked an 18-hour shift mm -hmm. to try to help out your mom. Mm -hmm. um, you read your bio and your background. That's the American dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it, you have a really honorable background. Thank you. Yet people look at you and see, they see the devil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with the media environment that we're dealing with. Um, and by that, I mean not just sometimes the coverage that comes out of Fox News, but also the social media environment that we operate in, is that so much of it is incentivized towards conflict and to exaggeration and to caricature that uh, it, is, it is sometimes funny that when I meet people in person, they say, oh, wow, you're a lot nicer than yeah. they say you but, are. <laughs> Lindsey Graham, he called you a communist. Yeah, yeah, no, he, he did. And it's unfortunate that, that that level of vitriol is almost governing our politics um, and that level of distortion Does it is governing hurt? our politics. I mean, it doesn't, I don't feel hurt by the, by someone like Lindsey Graham using that language. What I think I do feel hurt by is how it's getting perpetuated in our culture. I feel hurt when I see young boys succumbing to hate. That I think is, is hurtful more than any personal attack. You think our president has added to that? I do, I, I think he has. I think um, his continued focus on personally attacking people is unhelpful. I think it adds to, um, to really just a buildup, uh, this fever pitch in our politics that is just not sustainable. It's not sustainable. You've even said, let's stop asking the question if he's a racist. Yeah. You say he is. He, I, I don't think that it's even a question. He's using the direct language and terms of white supremacists. He was convicted as far back as the 70s of discrimination in his housing complexes. He came out on a full page ad for the Central Park Five sending innocent boys to jail. His language launching his presidential campaign, calling Mexicans rapists, you know, it's, it's not a question. Yet you're not afraid of being called a radical. I mm -hmm. saw in 60 Minutes mm -hmm. in your interview, you, you, you talked about Lincoln, you talked about FDR, um, that those people were radicals. Mm -hmm. it, radical is not a bad word, you don't think? I don't think radical is a bad word. Uh, radical... Is being a socialist a bad word? I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think so. I think ultimately it all comes back down to the things, the policies that we're actively promoting. And if, if the right wants to feather and tar me because I believe that health care should be a right in the United States, then they can go ahead and do that. Um, but when we cross the line into racism, into targeting, into violent attacks, into misogyny, that, that is not even about political ideology. That is just about hatred. Can we talk about El Paso for a second? Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted to ask you specifically, um, the shooter, as you saw, and I think it was Saturday afternoon or Saturday night when we saw it, mm -hmm. and it said um, something along the lines of, I want to kill as many Hispanics as possible. Mm -hmm. What'd you feel? Well, I think I felt scared. Yeah. felt scared for a lot of our families felt scared for our country. Um, white supremacy and racist violence is a Pandora's box. And the tools that it takes to unleash it are completely different than the tools that it's going to take for us to establish peace. And, and by peace, I mean the peace that Martin Luther King talks about, not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. And we're going to have to have very difficult conversations about white supremacy, not just white supremacists in the United States. 
Do, do you see a line connecting talking about Mexican rapists two years ago to El Paso? Of course, of course. It's always been about drumming up and creating an other and characterizing that other, dehumanizing that other. Hate is very different than love. Love is unconditional. You don't need anything to love somebody. But hate is very different than that. Hate requires an impetus, however false. People need false rationales to hate very often. And what the president has been doing is creating a caricature of people based on their identity in order to stoke hatred. But, but do you think people dislike you because of Medicare for all, forgiving tuition loans, mm -hmm. uh, the New Green Deal, to all these different things that are considered liberal or socialist ideas. Do, do they see you as a reflection of that and they dislike that? Or do, do you think it's more visceral? They dislike you because they see you as uh, an outspoken Latina mm -hmm. from the Bronx? Uh, I think it depends on who it is, but I think there are a lot of people in the Republican base and Trump's base and Fox News's base that have a visceral reaction to the color of my skin, that have a visceral reaction to my gender, um, and have a visceral, re visceral reaction to where I'm from. And then I think there are others who have a visceral reaction against what I'm fighting for, but there are subtexts there as well because there are lots of folks that have no problems with socialism when we're giving $16 billion dollars to worth of subsidies to farmers in the Midwest, but they will absolutely object to creating health care for all people if those people include, if that health care includes the poor, if that health care includes black Americans, if it includes immigrants. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. But you've heard the, that and many other issues mm -hmm. that the Democrats, the left wing, they're going to do this and they're going to destroy the party mm -hmm. and we're going to lose to Trump because of it. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I think it's just so short-sighted to say that. I think that people who subscribe to that approach are operating in a zero-sum understanding of the United States and of our voters. And those folks are so attached to the idea that we can only win elections with people who are already voting, as opposed to dramatically motivating millions of people to vote who have never voted before. That's how I won my election. 68% more people voted in my election than they normally do in an off-year midterm primary. We expanded the electorate by 68%. And the reason we did that and people tell me in the, on the street, I vote, the first time I ever voted in my life, it was to vote for you because I felt like you were, someone was finally fighting for us. Before I forget, I wanted to ask you about a, a, a big local issue. Mm -hmm. You were against the Amazon deal. I was. Do you regret that now? I don't regret it. Amazon's already setting up offices here anyway. They didn't need billions of dollars in subsidies and giveaways to come here. I think New York City is an attractive place to do business and we don't need to cut a special deal and, or give Amazon special treatment. And I think we, we showed in, at the end of the day that we were right. First of all, where Amazon did get a big government giveaway of Virginia, rents have already are already looking to be increasing by 17%. People in New York City cannot afford an almost a 15 to 20% increase in their rent. And second, secondly, Amazon came anyway. They're already coming. They're trying to set up shop in Brooklyn. They're hiring jobs out in Manhattan. So I don't think that we needed to give away $3 billion of public funds or corporate tax cuts in order to attract business to the greatest city in America. Uh, another local issue, and you, you, you kind of touched on it when you said that you expanded the electorate, and I think you were outspent 18 to 1 um, by Joe Crowley. Tiffany Caban wasn't able to replicate that. Mm. She came close. Came very close. Are you an anomaly in politics, or do you think you are a wave of what's 
coming? I, I don't think I'm an anomaly at all. You know, Tiffany Caban, even though she, she didn't quite clinch the actual election, first of all, they had to take that election to the courts. So at the ballot box, she was stronger than anybody ever predicted that she would be. And so I think that we are, we are working on a real movement in New York City and across the country. You know, according to all of the normal rules in politics, she shouldn't have even come close. And the fact that she pulled ahead on election night itself and that that election needed to be decided in the courts was, um, was something that I don't think the establishment really predicted. Back to, I guess, a local and national issue, um, the squad. <laughs> um, Everyone's in the squad. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, did that hurt also, go back to where they're from? Um, you know, like I said before, what hurt was not, not the president and his actions and his words, it was the fact that he is radicalizing stadiums of people in the United States. That is what is scary and hurtful. Um, I know a lot of people where that know someone in their family or have a friend that has been radicalized by this administration's rhetoric and they feel like they've lost a family member. Um, this is taking on a very different characterization, or a very different character than your typical political disagreements in a family. This is, um, you know, I, I have a fear that folks are, are giving into a blind loyalty and the allure of white supremacy in the United States. Uh, President Trump said, I don't believe the four Congresswomen are capable of loving our country. Well, I put on this pin every day, and I put it on over my heart because my job is to serve and love the people of this country and my community. And the president is saying those things because it is in his interest to dehumanize his political opponents to more easily stir up hatred towards them. And I'm not interested in drumming up hatred. I'm interested in winning hearts and minds so that our country can start to acknowledge the great pains and wounds that we have never addressed. Um, we paper over the legacy of slavery. We paper over the legacy of Jim Crow. We paper over the genocide of Native American people and the establishment of this country. And as a result, we paper over the institutional racism. We paper over the fact that the Supreme Court upheld Japanese internment. If we don't actually discuss racism in a real way in this country, we're not going to move forward. M many Democrats, I think, would agree with you, but on Medicare for all on mm -hmm. what one and a half trillion dollars for the tuition, the cost of free tuition in America, mm -hmm. um, the New Green Deal, all these things. I think they, they see that and they think, I agree with you, AOC. You're mm -hmm. you're doing a good job, but you're, you're just going too mm -hmm. fast and too far to the left. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think in the grand scheme of things, we have to ask how we just authorized $700 billion in a military budget each year. When we say $1 trillion, or we talk about trillions, a lot of these are 10-year cost projections that are often used. What we spend per year, $2 trillion in tax cuts for the very, very rich and corporations that frankly don't need it and won't miss it. Um, what we are experiencing right now as a country is extreme. And when we have our institutions dismantling, when our climate is, our climate is not going to wait for us to be politically comfortable with what it's going to take to fight climate change. And I'm okay with people saying that this is too much. Um, everyone is entitled to their opinion, but I am 
less concerned about what is politically palatable. I'm concerned about what is necessary to solve our problems. But, but, car but net carbon zero mm -hmm. within 10 years, does that mean you, you would hope that we wouldn't be driving cars within 10 years? No, net zero means the amount of carbon that we are producing is equal to the amount of carbon that we're drawing down. So it doesn't mean uh, z completely zero emission, it means net, net zero. Uh, so that could include offsets, it could include our transitions to renewable and clean energy. But, but would you like to see, I, I mean maybe mm -hmm. I mis misspoke when I said the net yeah. zero thing, but do you, would you like to see gasoline powered vehicles yeah. gone within Some, 12 years? Well, as much as it's technologically possible, I think we need to draw down our fossil fuels as much as, as much as we possibly can. I don't think we should build another pipeline at all in the United States of America. It's a matter of our survival. I don't even think it's a matter of political opinion. It's scientific fact. You've been faulted for not having all your facts right. Mm -hmm. What do you tell them? Well, you know, when you actually look at the individual instances, a lot of times it's, you know, we speak all the time. And whenever I have a, a slip of a figure and someone points it out, I'm totally fine correcting, say, sorry, not 10 years, 12 years, etc. But I don't think that um, there's been an instance where I haven't either corrected, and I don't think there's an instance where I've doubled down in the way, for example, this president does. But, but some people think you're not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you well, want, they can keep you, thinking that. <laughs> is, is that part of a grand plan here that you have? No, I mean, I, I, I'm not here to prove my worth. Um, Toni Morrison just, waste, just uh, passed, it away, passed away uh, yesterday, and one of the big things that she says is that um, whether it's racism or whether, whether it's any other form of dismissal, um, the point of it is to waste your time, and I'm not here to waste my time trying to prove my worth to people who don't believe in it. Um, I'm but, just but, here to do the job. But as you said a couple of weeks ago um, on CBS, mm -hmm. I think, um, go ahead, think yeah. that I'm not smart. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, you know, that, that's what happened in, what, what got what happened, you elected in 2018. Yeah, that's what happened in my primary. I, I like being underestimated. <laughs> it is a strategically advantageous position to be in. Do, do, do you feel on um, Israel, you said this administration has established concentration camps on the southern border of the United States for immigrants, mm -hmm. where they're being brutalized and dehumanizing conditions and dying. You got a lot of grief for using mm -hmm. the word concentration camps. Do mm -hmm. you regret that? Or do you think people misinterpret it? Yeah, well, I think I think there's a, there's a few things at play. One, I don't regret it at all. Uh, a group, in fact, of I think almost two to 200, at least 200 historians, rabbis, academics have come together in support of this term. Um, but you think the conditions are that bad at the border? Yeah, I've been there. Yeah. I've seen it. I, I sat on concrete floors with women whose hair was falling out and they were developing sores in their mouths. I, parents are dying with their children watching them. Um, and all without a trial all with just an accusation, and all with the intent to dehumanize. And, and again, this may be part of what the Republicans want to do, but they mm -hmm. painted that as anti-Semitic. Which, um, which is ahistorical. You know, if, it, if, you, if we study our history, which we're supposed to study our history, especially as as elected officials, I think we have a unique responsibility to study history. And what we see is that concentration camps are not unique to any one period of time. We in the United States have a history of concentration camps, camps with Japanese internment in South Africa. They were part of a larger process um, in the Holocaust, but uh, they were not unique, nor were they the actual death camps in the Holocaust either. Concentration camps are a facility when people are targeted and by their identity and held without trial. We've touched on this. Do you think 
by using language like that, that's mm -hmm. maybe why you're such a lightning rod? I do think that by elevating the term that academics and historians were already using to, to talk about the southern border, it started a conversation, a really important and urgent one, because the conditions on the border have been dire for quite some time. And I think that sometimes by what I believe is telling the truth can be controversial. Um, and I am knowingly and willingly telling that truth, which I know will be controversial. And I think that's, that is part of why people think I'm a lightning rod. Um, but it's not as though I'm, I'm trying to stir up trouble without cause or without intention. We need to save people's lives. And if calling things what they are is controversial, then, then so be it. Is it more important to you to get Trump out of office next year, or is it to move the party in a new direction? Well, I think moving the party in a new direction is how we get Trump out of office. So I see them as co-equal priorities, because if we work really hard to get Trump out of office and then advance the same policies and aren't as effective as possible in transforming people's lives, then we're going to get another Trump right back. And so in order for us to sustainably move in a positive direction, I think that the party, Democratic Party has to embrace our roots as the party of FDR and the party of the Civil Rights Act. I think we need to be bold in order to move forward and win. This interview here, you, you haven't done a lot of I've watched you on 60 Minutes, mm -hmm. I watched you on Steve McCovert, I watched you on The View, and mm -hmm. I was like a little bit like, well, what are you going to talk to us? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know if there is a strategic, I, I need to talk to the locals a little yeah. more. No, I think um, just in terms of our calendar, um, we've been doing the best we can, but now that we have recess, I just try to be fully present wherever we are. And so now that we have six weeks in our community to do this work, I think it's really important. How much of it is also the fact that you face election every two years, you've got another one coming well, up. Well, yeah, no, of course, that's that's built into our system as well. And so there, it has upsides in that the House of Representatives, I think, is the most um, reflective of public sentiment in that we do face re-election every two years. Um, but uh, so it requires us, it requires absolutely an elevated touch level with the community. When you are out either campaigning or just meeting and greeting folks, do they want to talk about impeachment? Do they say, we need to impeach this president? Yeah, they talk about what are we going to do about this president? What are we going to do about this administration? Um, they also talk about specific policies, immigration policies, the Muslim ban, um, what's happening at the border. They talk about Medicare, Medicaid, cuts to our services. Uh, a lot of these things are what's at the top of people's minds. You, you campaigned for Bernie Sanders um, back in 2016, mm -hmm. but you haven't endorsed him? No, no, I don't think I'm going to endorse in the 2020 field for really? some time. Maybe at least next year. <laughs> but I think that people, I think that people really need to not just watch the debates, but have the window of opportunity to really talk to these candidates and engage with them um, to learn more about them. And, and, make those and Elizabeth Warren, you like also. Yeah, I think she's fabulous as well. But Joe Biden, is he making a mistake by talking about being moderate? Um, I think it's less about talking about being moderate and it's more about talking, I think the mistake is in talking about why progressive ideals are wrong or quote unquote unrealistic. I think they're completely realistic, and I think it's how we choose to engage in these ideas that uh, we need to be careful about. You really think we'll get to Medicare for all? I think so. I think Free college tuition. I think, I think so. I think we have to work for it. You know, I don't think it's inevitable, but I do think that at their core, they are part of the solutions to what's going to bring us forward to the next century. And it's okay if they're radical ideas. Yeah.